Okay, moving along here um, with uh, Gregory Nisa of Nisa, The Life of Moses. I, um, we are at the subsection, Deliverance Announced. We ended last with the meeting of Aaron in defining um, the terms angel and the terms brother as having a kind of a dual nature of good and, and bad, depending on the context. Um, they're going to be putting this argument and uh, line of discussion aside for a bit. Uh, this section is called Deliverance Announced. Laying aside these matters for a later point in our discussion, we, where we shall give a fuller interpretation of them in their proper place, let us now turn to what is at hand. Moses, who had been strengthened by the shining light and had acquired such a brother as an ally and supporter, boldly delivered to the people the words of freedom, brought to their remembrance the nobility of their fathers, and gave his judgment how, gave his judgment how they could escape from their wretched labor of brick-baking. What then, does, what then does history teach us of this? That he who has not equipped himself by this kind of spiritual training to instruct the multitude must not presume to speak among the people. For you see how, while he was still young and had not yet matured to so lofty a degree of virtue, two men who were quarreling did not consider his peaceful advice worth accepting. Yet now he addresses tens of thousands in the same way. The history all but cries out to you not to be presumptuous in giving advice to your hearers in your teaching unless the ability for this has been perfected in you by a long and exacting training such as Moses had. When Moses had spoken these excellent words, had offered his hearers freedom, and had strengthened their desire for it, the enemy was provoked and increased the suffering of those who hearkened to his speech. This is not unlike what happens now. For many of those who have accepted the word as the liberator from tyranny and have identified themselves with the gospel are today still threatened by the adversary with onslaughts of temptations. Many of them do become more firmly established in their faith as they are hardened by the grievous assaults, by these grievous assaults. But some of the weaker ones are beaten to their knees by these misfortunes and say outright that it would be been more useful for them not to have heard the message of freedom than to endure these things for freedom's sake. The same thing happened when the Israelites, through meanness of spirit, blamed those who proclaimed to them deliverance from servitude. But the word will not cease at all from leading on toward the good, even if he who is yet young and immature in understanding should, childlike, be fearful of the strangeness of temptations. For this demon who does men harm and corrupts them is intensely concerned that his subjects not look to heaven, but that they stoop to earth and make bricks within themselves out of the clay. It is clear to everyone that whatever belongs to material pleasure consists assuredly of earth or water, whether one is concerned with pleasures of the stomach and the table or with the pleasures of wealth. The mixture of these elements becomes clay and is so called. Those who yearn after the pleasures of clay and keep on filling themselves with them never keep up the space which receives them full, for although it is always being filled, it becomes empty again before the next pouring. In the same way, the brick makers keeps on throwing yet more clay into the mold while it is constantly being emptied. I think that anyone can easily perceive the meaning of this figure by looking at the appetitive part of the soul. For if he who fills his desire on the one, uh, on the one of the things which he pursues should then incline his desire to something else, he himself, he finds himself empty again in that regard. And if he should fill himself on this, he becomes empty and a vacant container once more for something else. And we never stop doing this until we depart from this material life. The straw and its chaff, which those subjects to the tyrant's orders were required to mix in the brick, are interpreted by both the divine gospel and the sublime voice of the apostle as material for the fire. So that's uh, an interesting um, and very, very uh, poignant uh, treatment of the deliverance and now especially this last part where he talks about how uh, desires temptations desires of the flesh uh, never are really satisfying ultimately they are satisfying in the moment um, but uh, very quickly uh, that satisfaction is emptied and there is a uh, more desire to get that fulfillment again and this can be and is a lot of times a, uh, a cycle you can see it in cycles of addiction you can see it in cycles of um, uh, you know, what, every passion you can think of, whether it's, um, you know, um, sleeping around uh, while you're married. Um, I mean, you can think of, of, of dozens of them, but it, it never, it, it fulfills a sort of earthly, um, uh, earthly desire, uh, but it always empties again. Uh, there is a higher 
fulfillment uh, if one looks, looks towards God and towards the truth that one will attain. Um, however, once you look towards that higher truth, the temptations uh, and the adversary are motivated even more to um, to stop you from doing that. So I, I think that was uh, you know very insightful. I'm going to continue on here. The next section is the plagues of Egypt. Whenever someone who excels in virtue wishes to draw those who have been enslaved by trickery to a life of philosophical and free, the one who schemes against our souls with many different deceits, as the apostles say, knows how to introduce the deceit of trickery against the divine law. I am speaking here of the Egyptian serpents in the text, that is, of the many different evil tricks which the rod of Moses destroyed. We have probably already sufficiently interpreted the rod. Now he who possesses that invincible rod of virtue by which consumes the, rod, the rods of magic progress along his course to greater marvels. Marvels are not performed for the purpose of terrifying those who happen to be present, but they look to the benefit of those being saved. By these very marvels of virtue, the enemy is defeated and his own people are strengthened. If we learn the general spiritual intent of miracles, we would then be able to apply this insight to individual miracles. True doctrine conforms to the dispositions of those receiving the word, for although the word presents to all equally what is good and bad, the one who is favorably disposed to what is presented has his understanding enlightened, but the darkness of ignorance remains with him, the one who is obstinately disposed and does not permit his soul to behold the ray of truth. If our general understanding of these things is not false, the specific items would certainly not be different, since the individual part is demonstrated with the whole. So, then, it is not marvelous at all that the Hebrew, although living in the midst of foreigners, remains unaffected by the evils of the Egyptians. One can also see the same thing happening now in populous cities where people are holding contradictory opinions. To some, the stream of faith from which they draw by means of the divine teaching is fresh and clear. But to others, who live as the Egyptians do and draw by means of their own evil presuppositions, the water becomes corrupted blood. And many times the master of deceit endeavors to turn the drink of the Hebrews also into blood by polluting it with falsehood, that is, by presenting our doctrine to us as different from what it really is. But he cannot make the water wholly unusable, even if he should easily turn it red with his trickery. For since he pays no attention to the optical illusion, the Hebrew drinks the true water, even though he is successfully misled by the adversaries. The same applies to the frogs, ugly and noisy amphibians, leaping about, not only unpleasant to the sight, but also having a foul-smelling skin. They entered the houses, beds, storerooms of the Egyptians, but they did not affect the life of the Hebrews. The breed of frogs is obviously the destructive offspring of the evil which is brought to life from the sordid heart of men as though from, the, from some slimy mire. These frogs overrun the houses of those who choose to live the Egyptian life, appearing on the tables, not even sparing the beds and entering the very storerooms. One sees in this in the sordid and licentious life that which is indeed born out of clay and mire, and that which, through imitation of irrational, remains in the form of life neither altogether human nor frog. Being a man by nature and becoming a beast by passion, this kind of person exhibits an amphibious form of life ambiguous in nature. In addition, one will also find the evidences of such an illness not only on the bed, but also on the table and in the storeroom or th and or throughout the house. For such a man shows his profligacy in everything, so that everyone readily recognizes the life of the profligate and the life of the pure man by what is valued in each one's household. In the house of the one, there are f uh, frescoes on the wall, which by their artful pictures inflame the sensual passions. These things bring out the nature of the illness, and through the eye of passion pours in upon the soul from the dishonorable things which are seen. So, um, just quick commentary here. This passage reminded me of uh, our current predicament with having Netflix and all these different media channels on in the home on our flat screens. Um, so, back when uh, Gregory was of Nisa was writing this, yeah, he's speaking here of the um, profane man having filled his his home with artworks that uh, sensationalize and and, and um, fuel the passions. 
um, versus the uh, pure man who is mindful of these things. Uh, so I'm going to start really quick. This is the last passage in this reading um, to kind of read it in that context here. Uh, For such a man shows his profligacy in everything so that everyone readily recognizes the life of the profligate and the life of the pure man by what is valued in each one's household. In the household, in the house of the one, there are frescoes on the wall by which their artful pictures inflame the sensual passions. These things bring out the nature of the illness and through the eye, passion pours in upon the soul from the dishonorable things which are seen. But in the house of the prudent man, there is every precaution and foresight to keep the eye pure from sensual spectacles. The table of the prudent man is similarly found to be pure, but of the, but that of the man wallowing in the mire is frog-like and fleshy. And if you, re, if you search the storeroom, that is to say, the secret and unmentionable things of his life, you will discern there in his licentiousness a much greater pile of frogs. So um, that will be the end of this reading. Um, Next will be uh, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and free will. And we'll continue from there. Thanks for listening.